through using permaculture uh, to live more sustainably. Um, you know, in my community, they talk a lot about uh, rain gardens and using them as a way to just mm -hmm. recharge aquifers, I guess, is really the name. Um, but I don't know, is that in line with these principles or whatever, or is that not? Definitely, yes. yeah. I, I, uh, a gray water garden could just as easily be fed by rainwater if you had, if you weren't harnessing, if you weren't harvesting gray water for drinking purposes, you could use it for a, a rain garden. Uh, this is, I mean, a, a banana circle is, is an example of a rain garden that you're going to have a lot of. This is going to be more permeable in a rain garden, so when the water comes in, it, it Soaks up, right. soaks in, right. and it would probably be larger with rain gardens. You have to, uh, well, as well as banana circles. A lot of times, if if this is uh, if a banana circle is coming out of an individual bathroom with a, a small family, just one banana circle is, is sufficient. But if it's like at a school, we we make them at schools or or uh, community buildings sometimes, where you'll have this is the the corner of the house. And this could be a downspout as well, or it could be the, the edge of a parking lot or something where you're getting a lot of runoff. You could have a series of, of interconnected uh, banana circles or rain gardens that all you know, overflow into each other, something like that. Well, the rain gardens, you know, I'm familiar with, I mean, it's just using native plants, yeah. not not any food, or it's just a very, it's very much just native plants. Mm -hmm. But that still fits in with this whole thing, like that we're not growing food or... Like well, that. I would say why not grow food as yeah, well. Okay. I mean, uh, native plants, uh, perennials, um, you know, prairie plants are excellent and, and they, they do a lot of benefits for the soil. They provide a lot of beneficial insect uh, habitat and food. And so those are crucial to designing a good system so you can grow food crops. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend just growing all vegetables in a you know, even in a vegetable garden. I, I would want to mix in some native perennial plants as well and some trees and some shrubs. We're gonna get into that a little more when we talk about fields. But those are really beneficial to growing a vegetable garden because they reduce um, your need for additional fertility because a lot of native plants, uh, prairie plants, fix nitrogen. Um, and then uh, they also are great for minimizing pests and diseases. I have a quick question. I don't know if this is even appropriate to ask, but um, my, my son's father-in-law just oh, um, put a ring barrel on, like you were saying, for like this little memory garden he made for his wife. And he didn't have a problem with that, but I'd heard somewhere that there's some communities that are giving people a hard time about putting rain barrels in because they're saying that the water doesn't belong to them. That it's it's, it's a huge political issue, and I, I I'm just wondering if that's something that you've come across, or if you've had to like had to deal with communities that won't allow certain things, you know, building permaculture gardens and things like that. I just, yeah. Um, well, it, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, I mean, the places where I've, the, you know, the Stevens Point area where I've lived and, and worked a lot in Wisconsin is a very green community. So um, everybody is promoting rain barrels and water conservation and, and wise water use. Um, so, and, and I've worked a lot in places in developing countries where there aren't those types of regulations or, or strange attitudes about resource use. They were saying like if it rains over a certain community it belongs to the government of that community. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this really belongs to them. <laughs> yeah, it's Christmas. Well, I, I think, you know, in, in a one of the principles of permaculture is to, to try to capture resources that are coming onto your site and use them as much as possible before they leave your site. So water is a great example of that. When water falls, um, you know, passively, you don't have to, it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't require any energy for water to fall on your site, but if the water falls and you don't have any impediments to it, 
it's going to fall here, it's going to run off, and it's going to leave the site almost immediately, the same way that the water was, you know, rushing down the seasonal river. And so I think that it should actually be the legal, you know, the regulations should say that you're required to have rain gardens, you're required to have swales, you're required to have um, catching, you know, structures on your property, so it doesn't become a problem of too much runoff and flooding and erosion, you know. So those would be. Yeah. And the Center that I work at has an engineered wetland wastewater treatment system, so all the waste. I think, well, you would want to have like a primary um, biological filter, mm -hmm. something that it went through first and then. So like if, uh, like one of the areas that, one of the things we're thinking of, um, we have a couple of ponds right outside of our, right outside of our house where that we're thinking of linking into our, our gray water system. But we want to first run the, the gray water through some gravel and some sand and then have some aquatic plants like cattails and things growing in that to take up a lot of the, you know, the nutrients and then have the cleaner water go out and have that used for, for gray water. So I would say putting it through something like that. And really like that kind of a, um, we've been working with uh, aquaponics systems and um, you need the, the sort of habitat, not only for the plants to uptake things, but like the gravel and wood chips and things like that. And, and the compost here, you're really providing like habitat for beneficial microorganisms, which are the things that break down um, all of the, you know, grease and sewage and things like that that's you know, it's, uh, in your wastewater. So you need to provide that um, in addition to the food plants, but I definitely think it should be used eventually for something to bring it back <coughs> into the system instead of just letting it uh, keep going. In that banana circle where you put the compost in the middle, is that something where the compost keeps, like, I don't know, breaking down and you keep adding fresh compost on top? Or is it once it's filled, it's done? No, it'll keep shrinking and breaking down and eventually, you know, um, the nutrients leaching into the soil and being taken up by the plants that are growing around it. So you're going to just you constantly adding. be adding and adding, yeah. You always want to try to keep it as full as possible. So you continue to feed. You think of it as like your 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 home for, for all the, the micro microorganisms there. So you want to continue feeding them so they continue working for you. Kind of like uh, I mean an analogy would be like a yogurt culture or a, a sourdough culture or something like that. You want to keep feeding it to keep it active so it can keep doing you know functioning the way you want it to. Um, my understanding when, when things first start composting, doesn't it starve the trees and stuff of nutrients because it uses that to break it down and then releases its stuff like nutrients? That was always my understanding that you want to compost it and then feed it to the plants as opposed to composting it with the plants. Well, <laughs> it's it's the the roots of these plants aren't like living like in the compost. You're not okay, really so it's like you're not applying the compost directly, directly. onto okay. the plants. They're adjacent to each other. So they can, they're, you know, they're being fed through the soil. This is still soil here that the plants okay. are growing in. And it's like the compost and the, the gray water is moving, moving in okay. where their roots are growing. In. Yeah. It also depends on how your compost is made. You know, if you mm -hmm. apply uh, a fresh or uh, a non-finished compost, it yeah. still has a lot of carbon in it. If your carbon is too high in your compost and you add it, to your garden, it will uh, use nitrogen that's in the soil to break down that carbon, which will actually take nitrogen away from okay, you know, so the carbon. plants that were growing. So adding like too much carbon material to your garden can have that effect. Is the uh, bad smell an issue with the compost? Because our town is quite picky. Somebody wanted to keep two chickens on a little bigger land. And it was a uh, six month topic in the local newspaper. Uh, that will cause noise pollution and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, 
So when you have comp compost, is smell going to be an issue to the neighbors or when you have smaller parcels of land? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, you, you do need to uh, educate your neighbors as to what you're doing, but um, it's kind of, it's like with our, um, with our composting toilet, um, we, we take our, our, we mix all of our, our waste with uh, sawdust. So it actually, it's, it's a really simple system. It's, um, it's a wooden box with a bucket inside of it with a toilet seat over the top of it. And so when, uh, we, have a small, we have a small sawmill that generates a lot of sawdust. So uh, we have our, our toilet and our, uh, another bucket right next to the toilet that's full of sawdust. So we put sawdust into the bucket, we use the toilet, we cover it back up with sawdust. So um, we're adding a lot of carbon to the, to the nitrogen that's in the waste. So like if it's chicken manure the same way, having enough carbon to balance the nitrogen will then eliminate, almost eliminate the odor. But what it smells like, because we have this, we, we, we cut up like oak and cherry um, and you know hardwoods like that, our bathroom smells like a forest floor or it smells like, you know, humus because we have this moist sawdust, you know, in our toilet. So it's it's not an unpleasant smell, but it's it's a natural smell. And so educating your neighbors about what compost smells like, you know, might be something that you would need to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Um, so those were the what I consider to be the big six functions or things that, that permaculture addresses. Um, it's not limited to just those things, but I think those are the core things. Um, these are the three permaculture ethics that guide um, everything, all of all of the permaculture movement. So those are earth care, people care, and fair share. Um, so. I'd just like to ask you, what, what is uh, Earth Care? What do you think of when, what, what would Earth Care look like? Harmony among all the living beings in the world. That is one of the things. I really like that harmony. Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm. It's taking action. I mean, mm -hmm. care means you're not just thinking it, but you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also doing when it's necessary, as opposed to like, here's a bad example, but like, don't cut down a tree because you need sawdust. You know what I mean? The kind of thing, and even though you're doing what's right, it's like you only use what you have at your when not necessarily going on your way to make it work. I mean, I think that's kind of yeah, use it only when you need to. Yeah. Think about how much you need and uh, you know, try to use as little as possible you can, and as efficiently as possible when you have to. I read, when you said that, I thought about mom because she's always um, very humble. So I think humility is a really important aspect of that too recognize that you're not necessarily more important than the other animals in the ecosystem and and having love for the other animals like if you Anamma hugs a, a human being she has the same sort of loving expression as she has when she hugs uh, like a, a, a parrot or like a, when someone puts a turtle on her hand you know the same love is there she's not biased towards the human beings <laughs> Uh, he, he, he makes the statement that I really like that uh, a, a sustainable society or all cultures that are sustainable are they're sustainable because they know 
about the resources. They know where the resources that uh, provide for them come from, and they honor them deeply. So if you think about uh, traditional cultures, um, cultures that you would consider to, to still be sustainable, um, they all have that aspect built into their culture is a respect for and knowledge of where their resources come from, and their culture is they set up uh, their traditions, their celebrations, all deeply honor where those resources come from. That's something that I think our uh, so-called modern culture has completely become disconnected from. So I see permaculture as a way to rebuild those connections, to, to create new traditions, to, uh, to honor the earth more, and uh, to know where uh, our resources are coming from and take care of them. So the, the first one, earth care, is really the primary uh, part of permaculture and people care. We're a part of the earth. If we view ourselves as part of the earth, uh, taking care of the earth is really taking care of ourselves as well. And uh, fair share is, is again, it sort of uh, uh, feeds back into earth care because it, we can't have so much disparity, you know, where some people have access to all of the world's resources and other people don't because uh, that's going to lead to problems with taking care of the earth. So I'm going to go through some principles now, some of the, the really big principles and directives. So I think of these as um, all of the all permaculture systems that we try to build or create should be guided by these things. So they should have as many of these principles as possible. If you think about building a garden or building a house or harnessing rainwater or energy, um, they should uh, achieve these, or, or these principles should be true in permaculture systems. Um, everything gardens, I think is a really, it, it's, it's one of Bill Mollison's most famous sayings is that everything gardens, and it's, if you remember one thing today, just remember that everything gardens because it's it's kind of a deep statement about about the world and about our place in the world is that like we've been saying, everything has its own intrinsic value in the earth, but uh, it's also about observation and that you know we need to humble ourselves and look at all of the examples out in nature of all the other organisms out there and what are they doing to take care of the earth or play a part in the earth. How are they gardening? How are they feeding themselves, providing for themselves, and how are they giving resources back? So thinking about and observing uh, what patterns of things exist in nature is a really big part of permaculture. And modeling our, our gardens after the types of gardening we see happening in nature. The, uh, the, the next three are kind of a, a different way of of saying that as well. These are kind of ecological concepts and that everything is connected to everything else or should be connected to everything else. Um, a great example of things not being connected to other things is kind of the, the traditional suburban home with the yard and the house and everything being kind of separate, you know, and everything being very linear. You know, this uh, is, is not a very you don't see patterns like that, like the grid, the housing grid, the, the streets, the roads, you know, square, square things. You don't see a lot of those patterns in nature because uh, they tend to isolate things. And, and things that aren't connected to each other require more energy to maintain. They require more work to maintain. Whereas things that are connected naturally flow into each other. The, uh, the outputs of one thing satisfy the, the needs or the inputs of another thing. And so that's what, what we're striving for in permaculture systems is to have tight systems that are well connected, that have a lot of beneficial relationships with each other. So the last two here are the, the principles of multifunctionality. That uh, every function, like these, these functions here, these main functions, should be supported by multiple elements so different things in your system, like trees or animals or uh, your 
you know, the different, the different parts of your system, the ground covers, the mulch, uh, the garden. <coughs> and then every element as well, like, uh, just to give an example, like, uh, like an animal, like a chicken, should serve multiple functions or multiple purposes. It, you shouldn't have anything that just does one thing. You should always have it connected to, to serving multiple purposes. So if one person, we won't name names, might be guilty of this whole suburban thing, yeah. how do I, 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 in my little unfortunate suburban circumstances, make it more permaculture friendly? Uh -huh. how well, can I do let's that? just keep watching this picture, because I've got a couple other pictures. Uh, okay. This was actually our house um, six years ago. That, that we bought in Stevens Point on a tenth of an acre. And so um, one of the, the first thing we did was we, we dug up all of the grass <laughs> and uh, turned the whole area into garden beds and planted uh, cherry trees and currant bushes and perennial ground covers. And uh, we're able to grow a, a huge amount of food, vegetables, fruits, herbs, and mushrooms in that tiny little space. So we didn't require, you know, didn't have to go off of our house to, to bring in those other sort of resources. Our neighbors love it. It's just wonderful. So um, well, I'm thinking maybe we can chip in and have more of a response of the suburban homes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Okay, um, energy efficient planning is another big principle in permaculture. And uh, we're going to get more into this in the afternoon when we're talking about methods of design. But this is one of the, this, this little schematic here is one of the, the basic methods of permaculture design or the ways to think about. Um, it's called zone analysis and using zones of Zones are based on um, human patterns or your own patterns of use where you spend the most time. And the idea is to have most of your resources that you need most of the time and where you spend the most time should be the closest to you. So you don't have to go out, you know, way across, you know, your property to the back corner to uh, pick some vegetables from your garden. If uh, this is your house, you'd consider your house to be uh, zone zero. So that's where you live, that's where you spend the most of your time. So all of the things that you need for cooking, for medicine, um, where you're going to spend most of your time should be in zone one. So that's a great place for a kitchen garden, it's a great place for uh, shade trees, it's a great place for uh, medicinal herbs and, and things that you're going to use. It's a good place to, uh, to recycle gray water and to compost. So all of these things that you should be doing on a daily basis. And uh, you can think about zones, they're not always going to be, you know, they're very rarely going to be like circles like this around your property. It depends on what you know, the other existing features on your property are. Um, but you can think about other like, elements. This is a, a layout of a house there. And you can see it has this very intensive kitchen garden right here, right outside the back door and right along the main pathways where, you know, access is the easiest to get to those. But if you think about things like if you're going to have compost or you're going to have an herb garden or you're going to have chickens or something like that, um, figuring out where to place it, you can also think about how often do I need those things? Like if I need them on a daily basis, they should be in zone one. And also think about how often do those things need me? They need my attention. So if you have a fruit tree that mi a minimum if you have an apple tree, it needs to be visited a minimum of, say, four times a year, maybe more. In the spring, you're going to want to do uh, some pruning and some mulching, uh, maybe some sprays of some biological um, uh, fertilizers and things. Um, you're going to want to do some weeding or mulching during the summer. You're going to want to harvest, and then you're going to want to do some pruning in the fall. So 
If you're visiting it just four times a year, it should probably be somewhere out in zone two or zone three. It doesn't necessarily have to be right in your kitchen garden in zone one. Building small scale intensive systems. So this, this really gets back to that, uh, the idea of uh, necessitous use, you know, and conservative use. Um, one of the big ideas behind permaculture is that if we could, you know, convert all of our lawn space or our green space immediately around our, our houses and our cities and towns, uh, we could probably grow the majority of all of our food needs there and we wouldn't need to have, uh, you know, miles and miles of industrial scale agriculture. So a lot of those lands could be returned to native vegetation and habitat and forests. Um, some of the keys to building small scale intensive systems, this is a, an example of a forest garden or a guild where you have lots of different layers, at least seven different layers um, where you're going to have like a large tree canopy layer, uh, a smaller tree layer, maybe a fruit tree layer, a shrub layer. So you've got like a large tree, a small tree, a shrub layer, um, an herb layer, something that's going to grow like uh, an annual vegetable or a perennial herb layer, a root layer, and a ground cover layer. Like you, you could see maybe some strawberries here that are growing along the ground. And then even a climbing layer, there's a vine growing up here. So what you're doing is you're taking advantage of all of the different spaces, all of the different um, niche niches in, in the garden space so you're utilizing uh, space and light um, to the maximum potential to grow as much as you can you're also utilizing different underground layers you by planting these plants that have different root zones and different uh, nutrition needs and water needs so a guild is a group of, uh, of plants or animals that that grow harmoniously together, that complement each other. So this afternoon we have we'll have the opportunity to lay out uh, a planting guild using uh, some fruit trees here. I also brought some resources here, so maybe during lunch you can come up and look at these. So one of the one of the books I brought here um, is uh, called Edible Forest Gardens, and it's a really it's a two volume set uh, just on North American uh, permaculture or, or cold climate permaculture. So it's all about species that are specific to our growing area. Uh, the same goes for this one. It's the Holistic Orchard. It's a really good permaculture guide to uh, growing fruits and berries and nuts. Another principle is on uh, energy cycling. We talked about this, about uh, harnessing energy or catching energy as it comes into your site, reusing it as much as possible. Uh, that picture on the left, can anybody guess what that's a picture of? On the left, yeah. No, it's actually uh, it's uh, waste vegetable oil. That's one of my one of my hobbies. One of the things I do for fun is uh, go around to restaurants and uh, collect their their vegetable oil that they use. In Fryers for uh, fish fries and uh, frying. Fries are busy nights, huh? <laughs> fish fries, things like that. Um, and actually, this is a really old picture from uh, when we first started doing this um, many years ago. Um, we don't use. We, we've become more small scale and intensive with our filtering now. But those are all uh, these sock filters that you would pour the, the dirty oil into, and then it would filter through there. And uh, 